What's phosphoric acid actually like to know? Well, phosphoric acid is a viscous liquid. It's a strong acid, but not as strong as sulfuric or nitric acid. It tends to be used to give a sour taste in fizzy drinks. So there's actually quite a lot of phosphoric acid in fizzy drinks. There are various sorts of these species. If you remove a proton and replace it by a metal cation, then you can get various sorts. Many of these sorts are actually important fertilizers. So phosphates, as we'll come across, are extremely important in biology. And so when you're growing lots of crops on the soil, we've already recognized that we're going to deplete the nitrogen content of the soil because nitrogen is important in biology. So is phosphorus. And so you can put phosphorus back into the soil using phosphate salts and so potassium phosphate is an important uh, fertilizer. Calcium phosphate is a common mineral and of course it is calcium, either calcium hydroxyapatite are the mineral materials which are the composite components of your bone. So phosphates are really important minerals in teeth and in bones. Now if you have some species which contains OH groups, and you probably would have encountered this or you will encounter this in the context of things like polymerization chemistry. If you have two OH groups adjacent to one another, then that species is set up to eliminate water. And if it eliminates water as drawn by, uh, as enclosed by this box here, then what you do is you have a condensation reaction that introduces a phosphorus oxygen phosphorus linker. So this is essentially the process that needs to take place to take phosphoric acid and turn it into a phosphate mineral-like material. You need to condense out the water and generate these POP linkages. And these kind of species, polymeric or oligomeric phosphate species, are extremely important, again, in biology. This kind of material is the backbone that's present in your DNA <laughs> molecules. So pyrophosphate is quite a common example. P2O74 um, is what you get if you take this species here and deprotonate it four times, then that will give you the pyrophosphate anion. And that, again, is quite an important mineral anion. You can do this process and you can continue almost infinitely generating these chains. And then once you have a chain, of course, you can cross-link that chain by taking these and condensing across here. And you end up with a situation where you have essentially lots of tetrahedral phosphorus centers which can be linked into chains and then cross-linked and generate two-dimensional and three-dimensional structures. The biologists will recognize that polyphosphates are really important biological molecules. And the most important, perhaps, of all the biological molecules, and I guess DNA is very important as well, but the thing that certainly predominates in the body in terms of the content of phosphorus is adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, as it's normally used. ATP is this molecule here, and here we have our triphosphate species. So you can see that this triphosphate species is the product of condensing phosphorus or phosphates together. Now what happens in a biological cycle in order to generate energy is that this species, which is a product of condensation, will react with water, and it will react with water to cleave these phosphate bridges and generate a diphosphate species. And that's an exothermic process. It gives out energy. So the way that the body uses energy, controls its energy supply, is in essentially the balance between these two molecules. If you want energy, then you use your ATP. If you want to store energy, then you take ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and you add a phosphate group to it. And so what that means is that the body contains really significant quantities of these two molecules. Right, so adenosine triphosphate. Let's have a little quiz at this point. I'm sure the biochemists should know. So if I was to ask you how much ATP, how much adenosine triphosphate, does the average human produce every day? It is, in fact, 70 kilograms. So let's be clear about this. You don't have 70 kilograms of ATP in your body at the moment, 
but you are continually recycling the ADP and the phosphate and during the course of a day you will generate 70 kilograms of ATP and consume 70 kilograms of ATP.